This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening, we're going to be continuing on the topic of bones and joints uh, repair. Um, and we are going to, rather than look at the small perspective of bones and joints, we're actually going to take three steps back and look at the global um, uh, vision, the global view, uh, a view I think many of you will find very interesting. Uh, I think you'll find it informative and uh, hopefully a bit inspirational uh, as we go through uh, our talks this evening. Uh, I'm very happy uh, I'll be the moder moderator and I'm very happy to have several of my colleagues that I work with on a daily basis. Uh, Dr. Dave Scher, uh, he'll be discussing more the epi epidemiologic uh, view of injury and trauma globally. And Amber Caldwell will uh, take that uh, need and th that burden and look for a solution that hopefully is uh, sustainable. So here we go. So why are we here? Why are the three of us here? Um, what brought us here? Uh, it uh, actually is a story. So I'll give you my own personal story uh, that started a few years ago. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I uh, graduated from a medical school in Puerto Rico. I did all my training in New York, uh, but I always had a bit of a wonderlust about the world. Uh, after I started in private practice, I really wanted to do more than bunions and ACLs and things like that. So I started to volunteer. I went uh, on mission trips, which is what many of you uh, maybe have seen, where people put lots of boxes together and, and travel uh, to places, many Central America. And so I did about 25 trips, mission trips, orthopedic surgery trips to uh, Central America. Uh, very rewarding. Uh, but I started to question perhaps impact and the like. So it was in 1996, I actually decided to do something further. And I looked uh, up an organization called Orthopedics Overseas, uh, which really emphasizes teaching and training. And I signed up, uh, having been a, uh, somebody that was an activist in the 70s uh, against apartheid, I signed up for a two-month mission in South Africa. So at 35,000 feet, I was flying over the Atlantic and uh, on my way to South Africa. And I noticed uh, the, the, a book that my neighbor was reading uh, who was sitting next to me. I found out she was a nurse, and she also was going to do service in South Africa. And, the book was uh, the autobiography uh, by Albert Schweitzer, uh, Out of My Life and Thought. Uh, I looked at it, I saw some pictures, and I was struck by a vivid recollection that, in fact, I had seen that book when I was in third grade. My teacher had that book and was singing the praises of uh, Dr. Schweitzer, and it had a very indelible imprint on me. And in fact, I think 
uh, brought the seeds of uh, uh, what would later be my ability to have compassion, to have further understanding of a global world, and hopefully be an activist. Uh, with that, uh, I've been working now. I'm a uh, uh, clinical professor at San Francisco General, now known as Zuckerberg San Francisco General. And I started there 25 years ago, left private practice, and uh, joined the mission that I thought meant the most to me. And that was serving those in need, serving those vulnerable. Um, we started... Uh, the Orthopedic Trauma Institute uh, a little over 10 years ago officially, uh, Dr. McLeod and I, and we really do embrace that mission of mend the injured, inspire innovators, and empower leaders to restore lives. So we've been very, very fortunate. Um, we're surrounded by bright people, passionate people, and been very, very uh, lucky uh, to have others who embrace that same philosophy. Uh, there will always be a need to mitigate uh, the impact of uh, uh, much trauma around the world, uh, such as disaster, both uh, natural and, as we've recently found out, man-made, uh, the tragedy in Orlando. Uh, road traffic accidents you're going to hear more about uh, are a scourge, an epidemic, and something that is really impacting uh, the world's economy. We do know that the, there's an enormous gap in healthcare providers. Uh, the continent of Africa alone is uh, believed to have uh, a need of over a million healthcare providers. We also know that many of the health systems around the world are really threatened uh, with this onslaught of road traffic already on overburdened health systems for HIV, TB, malaria, and the like. So uh, with that uh, somewhat cheery review, uh, we're going to uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Scherer. Uh, Dr. Scherer is uh, an assistant clinical professor at uh, UCSF. He uh, is very well trained, University of Washington. For undergraduate school, did his master's in public health at Harvard, uh, trauma training at Harborview in Seattle, and uh, he is working with me uh, at uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General. So, David. Thank you, Rick, and uh, for that introduction, and good evening. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to be here um, and uh, uh, share this uh, with you. I feel uh, very indebted to um, mentors like uh, Rick Coughlin, who have uh, understood this problem long before uh, most of the world's even begun to uh, understand it. So um, the goals of my portion of this talk really are just to uh, start to put some numbers uh, to this burden of trauma that uh, Rick alluded to. Uh, and then define a little bit uh, about what the role of musculoskeletal uh, injury and orthopedic surgery uh, are in this kind of broader picture of global health that we don't necessarily uh, typically uh, think about orthopedic surgery. What do we usually think about with orthopedic surgery? Well, <clears throat> I can say that, you know, my, I think the most common uh, things that we think about are sort of these bread and butter procedures we do in orthopedics, things like arthroscopy and arthroplasty. You probably know a lot of buzzwords now. Uh, about minimally invasive surgery and uh, computer-navigated surgery and maybe even robotic surgery is on the horizon. Um, well, today we're going to take a, a little bit different perspective. We're really not talking about the cutting edge of orthopedic surgery here in the United States, but we're going to take a global view. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about orthopedic surgery in other places, not in the blue countries, which the World Bank defines as high-income countries, but rather in the gray areas, which are uh, places defined as low- and middle-income countries. So these are not going to be uh, the same high-income problems that necessarily we think about all the time uh, here in the United States, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I um, hope that you'll agree with me at, by the end of this that they are uh, very important and very impactful. So uh, orthopedic surgery and global health um, on some ways, at least for me, before I got involved in this, almost seemed like an oxymoron, like how do those go together? Before I'd gotten involved in this work, I had these sort of um, 
unsophisticated views or unsophisticated ideas, I guess, of what um, uh, global health might look like. I mean, I sort of envisioned like you're going in the jungle and you're going to cure some tropical disease. You've got your cargo pants on, like Sean Connery over here, and you're you're going to go find the cure for cancer or the cure for some tropical disease. Um, and the reality uh, is that it, it looks very different than that. And when I first went on one of these trips, uh, when I first got involved, um, before I left, I was all worried about my malaria prophylaxis. And when I arrived, I just hoped that I would make it home safely uh, from the airport to my hotel. Because if any of you have traveled uh, in uh, a developing country, you, you'll, you'll realize that the roads um, are extremely dangerous. They're um, overcrowded. Um, uh, the vehicles themselves are overcrowded, as you can see in these pictures. Um, and it creates uh, a really dangerous environment. Um, and that's really uh, at the root of uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and why is this? So um, the, this graph, I think, illustrates it well. And it really has to do with the rapid urbanization that's occurred in most low and middle income countries. And I'll just highlight Africa and Asia, which are two of the places where uh, we spend uh, time doing some of this work. And if you look in the 1950s, a vast majority of these populations were living in uh, rural areas. And that's, that's rapidly changing um, and is projected to be more than half of these countries will be in urban areas uh, by 2030, uh, more approximating um, uh, what we see here in the US. And so I have this guttural reaction that these, are, these roads are unsafe, but, but what do the numbers say about this? Is this just my feeling that the roads are unsafe, or, or do the numbers support that? Um, that these are, this is a problem? And the answer is yes, um, resoundingly, actually. And if you look at uh, mortality from trauma globally, um, the number of deaths from trauma is actually uh, markedly higher than HIV, AIDS, uh, TB, and malaria combined, um, which is really uh, quite staggering when you think it, when you contrast that with what our typical view of what global health uh, really looks like. Um, and where do these, uh, where do, what is trauma, what does that constitute? You might uh, envision, especially with current events and what we hear about in the news, that this would all be like violence. This would be wars being fought and uh, conflict that's generating this trauma. And, and that's a piece of it, about 2%. Um, but it's really a small piece. And a much bigger piece is actually road traffic injuries, uh, which are more than tenfold uh, what uh, the amount of uh, uh, death that occurs uh, annually. Uh, due to trauma. And there's a, a variety of other things that are also very uh, significantly impact these numbers. And as an orthopedic surgeon, I look at these, and these are the same uh, mechanisms of injury that uh, lead to a lot of patients that I see. I mean, the vast, more than half of these are very common mechanisms for a lot of orthopedic, uh, a lot of orthopedic injury. So what does that mean to me? Well, that just indicates to me that these mortality numbers, which are what we can most easily access, because even in developing countries, there often are at least numbers on mortality. But I think that there's really just, that's just the tip of the iceberg, because there's a tremendous amount of uh, non-fatal injury that also occurs with these mechanisms. Um, and this uh, pyramid is just showing that, that um, at the tip of the pyramid are these fatal injuries that we're able to record, but there's much more than that. There's some that uh, are only hospitalizations or may even never present to any healthcare provider at all. But nonetheless, they still may result in a lot of long-term and chronic uh, disability. The numbers for this are, are not as probably accurate as they are for mortality because they haven't, it's more difficult to record for the reasons I just showed. But it's been estimated that there's about 40 million uh, disabled every single year uh, due to uh, trauma. Just to put that in perspective, it's about the population of the entire country of Spain every year permanently disabled uh, secondary to trauma, which is, I think, uh, fairly staggering. So how do we put these, how do we put these together? Um, if you're the World Health Organization and you're trying to understand how does uh, we account for deaths or broken legs or spinal cord injuries versus HIV or malaria or tuberculosis, how do we uh, kind of understand this, put this all together uh, to understand how we make priorities? And the way we do it is a thing called Disability Adjusted Life Years, uh, or DALIs uh, for short, um, which is a combination of uh, disability and 
uh, mortality. And the way it's done is essentially for any given um, disability, there's a weight that's assigned. And for any given um, thing that causes loss of life, it's estimated how many years of life are lost, lost relative to uh, an average lifespan. And that sums into this, this quantity known as DALIs. Um, and so now if we, if we think now in terms of DALIs, so this is mortality combined with disability, how does trauma compare to some of these other problems? And as you can imagine uh, from prior slides, um, it's, it's quite staggering. So injuries are about 11% of total uh, morbidity and mortality uh, globally. Um, and this is not just, uh, this is high income countries and low and middle income countries, but you can see that it's uh, orders of magnitude greater than some of these other diseases that we most commonly think of uh, in the global health uh, conversation. And it's more than, again, all of those other uh, most common things, which are TB, HIV, TB, and malaria uh, combined. If you just look at uh, road traffic, and here RTA is a road traffic accident, I apologize. So RTA is road traffic accident. Uh, if you rank order um, these uh, road traffic accidents, um, in the 1990, it was the number nine cause of um, <coughs> death and disability. And it's predicted, projected because of these issues we're talking about of urbanization, uh, and also because of the relative uh, decrease of some other problems, it's gonna be the number three cause of uh, global uh, DALIs uh, in the world behind heart disease, IHD is heart disease, and depression. So it's a huge problem and it's a growing problem. So who does, who does trauma impact? Who are the uh, unfortunate victims of this epidemic? Um, well, number one, the poor are disproportionately affected by this problem. Uh, about 90% of injury-related uh, deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. Um, so it is a, a huge problem. Um, the young um, are also very disproportionately affected by trauma. It's the number one cause of death and disability between the ages of 15 and 49. And men, actually, are disproportionately affected uh, compared uh, to women, which I think is relevant, uh, particularly in a lot of low and middle income countries, uh, because it, in essence, this is uh, a problem that affects young, uh, poor uh, breadwinners in many cases and in many of these settings who do manual labor. So it's a, it's a huge impact. Um, there's not as much data as uh, there ought to be on this topic, but in one study from Ghana, there was a 40% of um, Families uh, reported decline in family income after uh, uh, trauma. 20% had to borrow money, and 25% uh, reported decline in food consumption. So that's on the individual family level. What about on a societal level? So at the societal level, um, road traffic injuries have been estimated to cost as much as 5% of GDP. So um, it's, it's a massive problem uh, in, these, in these countries. On a more personal level, um, this is a patient that uh, we've seen uh, in our, we recently were in Tanzania, um, and this is uh, a gentleman, uh, Rajab Mohammed Abdi, who, um, he's in his 30s, and he was uh, in a um, uh, motor vehicle crash uh, and sustained a complex uh, lower extremity injury. This is, uh, this isn't actually his x-ray, this is a, a different patient, but this is much what his injury looked like. Uh, he had a, a broken bone in his uh, thigh and the femur. Uh, he had a broken leg, um, all the broken tibia, um, and actually both, both limbs were affected. Um, and very unfortunately, on one side, he ended up having an amputation. Um, and prosthetics were not available uh, for over a year and a half, and he was unable to work and unable to uh, provide uh, for his family. Um, and this story is, is just one of, of many, unfortunately, like this. Thankfully, this one uh, has a better ending, but that, that comes later. So what's the global response? What is the global health community doing in response to this, this epidemic of trauma? And, and trying to understand the global health world, at least for me, is a lot like looking at the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It's very confusing. There's a lot of different players involved in global health. It's kind of an alphabet soup. Um, and everybody 
is doing really great work, but every it's it's confusing, and there's a lot of people asking for money. A lot of people have, with different approaches, doing different things, uh, not necessarily coordinated, and it's very confusing. So I'm not going to uh, try to explain uh, the bigger picture of global health uh, in this talk, uh, except to say that. Um, Really, trauma and orthopedics has kind of gotten left out of the discussion. It's really not uh, been addressed largely, unfortunately. Um, and to put it a little bit more graphically, um, this is a, this is a um, graphic that demonstrates the flow of global health funding uh, from uh, a variety of largely countries, but also f uh, philanthropic donations. Uh, and how it flows uh, into uh, a variety of different uh, disease conditions. Um, and the size of the gray bar on the uh, right side of the screen represents uh, sort of the percentage of funding that these different uh, entities receive. So you'll see that HIV AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, uh, malaria are all uh, receive a fairly large uh, amount of funding for global health. But what about injury? What about trauma? What about road traffic accidents? Well, there's somewhere, there's somewhere buried in here uh, under a thing called non-communicable diseases, which includes injury, but it also includes things like uh, diabetes, it includes cancer, uh, it includes uh, virtually any non-communicable disease. So uh, it's in non-communicable diseases are 1% of what of all of this uh, global health funding. And injury, unfortunately, is only one small fraction of that small fraction. So um, it's really, it's not to say that these other things aren't important, because obviously they're very important. But it's disproportionate, uh, the amount of funding, unfortunately, that trauma receives, despite its uh, tremendous impact. So if not the global health community, then who? Um, and we think as orthopedic surgeons, we have a role to play in this, and we think that the needs uh, are understood. You know, there's obviously a big piece of this is going to be injury prevention, uh, strengthening of trauma care systems, emergency medical transport systems, and also we think very important uh, improved uh, surgical care uh, to help reduce some of the disability after injuries occurred. Even in the U.S., despite uh, in Europe and other countries where there's a safer roads, trauma still exists, but we reduce disability by treating it well. Um, and that's something um, that unfortunately uh, doesn't always occur in many of these settings. Surgical missions, uh, uh, Rick alluded to, it's probably been, in, in our field, it's probably been the main uh, way that orthopedic surgeons have tried to make a contribution. And they're, uh, I think, a very Im important thing, and I don't mean to undervalue them in any way, but they're limited. Um, there's, there's 40 million disabled every single year. It's not realistic to think that we're going to have 40 million surgeons traveling the world uh, curing all these patients. Um, and there's issues with those patients. Who do they follow up with? Um, and how do you sustain these programs? Um, so <clears throat> that's where I'm going to end. I'm going to leave this a little bit open-ended because the next speaker is going to talk a little bit about more about what the solutions might look like. But just to summarize, um, Road traffic injuries and trauma are a, a massive and growing epidemic. Um, they cause more death and disability than malaria, HIV, uh, uh, and TB combined. Uh, and the funding doesn't, uh, is not nearly uh, proportionate uh, to the impact that these problems have. And locally, uh, locally driven and sustainable solutions, I think, are really what's needed. So thank you. <clears throat> Excellent work, Dave. Uh, our next uh, speaker, and uh, we'll be having questions after uh, our next speaker, so I'll write them down. Um, the next speaker I, I'm thrilled to introduce is uh, my work wife. Um, Amber Caldwell uh, graduated from UC Santa Barbara. Um, she graduated in Global International Studies. Uh, she also has received a certificate health policy uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, 10 years ago in a bar in the mission, uh, we uh, started uh, the Institute for Global Orthopedics and Traumatology. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, Amber Caldwell. I'm really excited to uh, be here tonight. And thanks, Rick, for the introduction and Dave for setting the tone of the talk tonight. So. 
my goal is to try to describe what we've done to this problem um, in regards to our Institute for Global Orthopedics and Traumatology and how you as people in the community and part of this university um, can get involved. So I'd like to take a moment to emphasize the role universities play in global health, in particular in um, studying the burden of global health problems. Our own San Francisco General played a major role in the HIV AIDS epidemic and coming up with the treatment protocols for ARVs. So universities house experts and they're uniquely positioned to collaborate and help solve some of the world's uh, biggest problems. As Dave described, uh, trauma and orthopedics is a big global health burden, but the good news is we do have solutions. We know how to fix broken bones. We also know how to treat some of the major trauma issues that our colleagues abroad face on a daily basis. The challenge really is spreading that education uh, sustainably and in a way that doesn't end with just a surgical mission or our colleagues going there and operating on the short term. So I got is really a philosophical change in the approach of dealing with orthopedic trauma. We truly believe in academic partnerships and our mission is really to uh, spread the power of surgical education to help save the limbs and lives of people all over the world. We do this through four programmatic pillars. Um, I'll go into each one. Surgical education is really about bringing experts um, to other experts in country and help transfer skills um, and transfer techniques. Our main pillar and kind of pearl of this program is our SMART course, which stands for Surgical Management and Reconstructive Training. This is a core curriculum that has been uh, evolved over the years. We're in our eighth year of teaching the course in San Francisco, and we just got back from Tanzania a few weeks ago, it's our fourth year teaching the course in, San Fran or in Tanzania. We reach 140 surgeons a few weeks back in Tanzania across 10 countries, and we taught them limb-saving uh, surgical techniques. I can't really speak to the power of this program myself and from, with lecture slides, so I wanna show you a quick little video that illustrates this program. There is one case which I remember. The child was brought here very young, and at the end of the day, they amputated that child. We have been taking care of her. She's receiving prosthesis. She's still receiving uh, treatment for us. She's about 18 years now. She's studying, and I hope she will go up to the university. She's wearing the prosthesis. She's very beautiful. <laughs> The burden of amputees in Tanzania has increased because of the introduction of motorcycle. So many people are ending up with a lot of accidents. We receive one new patient a day. Some of other days there may be three or four. And many people end up into a lot of deformities and among those are amputees. are the people who are taking care of their families, they're taking care of their relatives and their parents. It's very challenging for them. The injuries that they see here are oftentimes the open fractures that expose bones, which if not cared for appropriately, the, the patients will lose their limbs. One of the, I think, difficult parts of being a surgeon anywhere is when you're presented with a problem that you can't fix. To not be able to save an extremity and to know that the patient will be relegated to an amputation um, is very difficult to, to take for the patient and for the physician. Almost invariably, surgeons uh, in the developing world have great technical ability. Very eager learners, it's just about having the educational resources, giving them the um, 
knowledge and the ability to perform these advanced techniques in order to uh, reconstruct the limbs. They think they give us a very small knowledge, but that knowledge is so precious to us because it gives us power to do more, to help, and to help ourselves. From the beginning, since I was in undergraduate, I liked a lot the orthopedics. And other students were worried, why are you liking these things? Most of them were liking to do them, to become physicians. There was a certain thing pushed me through orthopedics. I want something more. Through the course which I attended, the SMART course, we were able to fix many difficult fractures from plateau, acetabulars, the pelvis. We learned a lot from them. So we share the knowledge, I get encouraged, and uh, I thank God now I can do many things. I was born in Ramadan, Tadeo. I was born in National. We got a very good exposure from these, our, our professors. While they come, we go with them theater, they teach you the tricks. When they go, you keep on doing them slowly till you catch up. The way I've been taught, I always keep on teaching others. And I believe even right here in our country, we could make it. I think one of the things about these courses are we're, we're providing them with something that they'll be able to use forever. You were teaching someone with the goal that they're going, that they could one day supersede you. Our highest aspiration is really to render ourselves unnecessary in the future. And once we're able to really establish that kind of environment that fosters not just clinical excellence, but research and education, we can really know that our job is done. is about kind of teaching to fish, not to fish for them. And the Smart Course program has a real ripple effect. So most of the folks that have attended our course have gone on to teach an additional three to five um, other colleagues. And we're excited to bring the course to other countries. So in November, we'll be teaching it in Nepal with our colleagues in Kathmandu and part of the um, Nepal Orthopedic Association. And we're hoping to expand the program to more countries. Um, and videos like what you just saw are part of our role as advocates and leaders. It's really important to have a stronger, louder voice for trauma in, in not just locally, but globally. Um, and we try to do that through a number of ways. Most of us are, serve as leadership roles in different societies. Um, Dr. Coughlin and our other co-founder, Dr. Rich Goslin, received the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Humanitarian Award, which is a pretty renowned um, award, so we're lucky to have that leadership in our own backyard. Um, and speaking of our own backyard, we host a Bay Area Global Health Film Festival. This summer will be our fourth year of doing this event. It's a standing room only um, kind of vibe, and we partner with local organizations on a, on a theme. So this year's theme is homelessness, addiction, and mental health, which translates to our trauma patients, not, at, not only at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General, but also in Tanzania and Malawi and where we work abroad. Research is really at the core of what we're trying to do to build up the data and better argue for, um, for resource allocation and changes in the way orthopedics and trauma is viewed not only in the global health landscape but also locally to drive some uh, resource allocation and change policies. We've uh, been fortunate to have really strong leaders at our partner institutions, some of which have gone on to receive um, high awards in, in research at our own national programs, uh, which is pretty impressive. And this is a photo that was just texted to me at three in the morning on Monday from uh, our resident who's in Tanzania enrolling a patient in our amputee study. So we're looking at the long-term outcomes of um, amputees in Tanzania, as well as a socioeconomic impact um, being an amputee has on, on the patient and the health system. And really, 
I got us centered on relationship building. Um, we couldn't do what we do without our partners, and we have a formal exchange program which helps bring, bring us closer to our friends and colleagues um, abroad. So just to bring it back to our patient Rajab and how IGOT's programs uh, kind of have come together to impact just the one patient. His injuries, as you know, were complex, and the surgeons who treated him understood that the risks of these injuries um, were very significant. Uh, they know that because they've been involved in our training programs and saw how we treat patients um, here in our own backyard. They also understood that it would be the surgical technique that's used to treat his broken bones that would give him uh, an opportunity to walk again. They chose to treat him with an IM nail, which is what we've taught them to use, um, and that basically let him keep his, um, his one leg. Fortunately, the trauma on the residual side resulted in an amputation, but through the SMART course um, and teaching those rotational flaps, he, Dr. Mwanga, his surgeon, was able to deal with the open tissue um, infection and also the defect, um, which allowed him to keep the, at least that one leg. And through our advocacy and our uh, exchange program, he was able to get a prosthetic leg from his own prosthetic colleagues, which were actually at the neighboring facility, and they were able to fit him with a leg. So two years out from his injury, he's now back to work and providing for his family. Uh, and that's just one example of how this collective academic partnership can uh, make an impact. So we talked a lot about the problems of orthopedics and trauma, and we talked a little bit about different models to uh, provide solutions, but when tackling a problem as complex as trauma, it's, uh, it's only logical to have a more comprehensive solution. So investing in orthopedics, investing in, in trauma systems, empowering surgeons really does um, have a huge impact. It is a long-term investment, um, and it's really about investing in the people, the centers, the research, the questions, the systems, um, and the next generation of orthopedic leaders. So I encourage you to get involved with our organization, um, IGOT. Uh, you can visit our website, and you're welcome to uh, participate in any of our events, which are all on our website. And I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Okay, hopefully um, you've learned some things that you didn't know before. Did anyone learn anything here? Some things, and uh, uh, again, I, th I think um, part of uh, what I learned a long time ago is it is important to sort of blow your own horn uh, a little bit, especially when you know you're doing the right thing. Um, one of the things that I noticed very early in doing these mission trips and. Central America was the plastic surgeons were pretty savvy about bringing all the the video equipment and showing all their fine works and uh, they're far far ahead of ahead of us in terms of uh, at least advocating for their own uh, practices. So um, let's hear any questions. Otherwise, I'll, I'll yes, go ahead. So the question is, uh, what what have we done to to allow uh, this great burden to occur underneath our noses, I guess, uh, is your, your question. And I, I think there's some definite uh, answers to that. David will kind of go into the epidemiology. Yeah, I mean, I think the big issue has been um, the kind of access to and supply of motor vehicles. I mean, the convenience of a lot of these things, I think there's a rap major, major demand uh, for transport, um, I think for obvious reasons. But the problem is there hasn't been a concomitant um, improvement in road quality or road safety or traffic laws or speed bumps or any of a number of things that could potentially uh, help to reduce the number of uh, road traffic injuries. Um, that's kind of the preventive side for why the injuries happen. And then in terms of the treatment uh, side of it, um, you know, I think the some of it's on us. I mean, I think as orthopedic surgeons, I don't think we've really advocated for this, uh, this problem as much as infectious disease has um, 
for whatever reason, it's, it's much more um, pervasive, uh, uh, the understanding that people have, I think, and the awareness people have of, of HIV and malaria and these other problems. I think uh, the average person could, uh, could, could cite those problems as major global health issues. I don't think that most people would even know that this is. And I think, um, you know, maybe that's a reflection of us not having had as much of a, um, a loud enough voice and enough of a global health kind of presence to uh, to advocate that this is a problem and these trauma systems need to be built up. Uh, and I'd, I'd also say that uh, we we are in uh, not quite lockstep with with some of our general surgery uh, uh, comrades and compatriots. Uh, uh, surgery really uh, has has been extremely neglected uh, as a public health problem. The uh, the thought was surgery is just very expensive, and it's something that public health officials uh, and experts thought that you know to to uh, surgery is an end game type of thing. You focus more on on uh, uh, prevention and uh, vitamin D and uh, immunization and sure all of those things actually are cost effective. And it really wasn't until uh, the last 10 years or so with good studies uh, that we were able to look at the cost effectiveness of surgical intervention, such things as cataract surgery, uh, even hernia surgery, and trauma surgery in, uh, in developing countries. So we've been able to actually go in and do the numbers, and the numbers actually are comparable to many of the uh, the you know, public health interventions that our colleagues in infectious disease or uh, ARVs and et cetera, which are extremely costly. But again, if we're able to start to measure this correctly, we're in the, you know, in the game. Um, our, our own Dr. DeBoss, that maybe many of you know, was really one of the global leaders of, of the surgery movement. And uh, Rich Gosselin, my colleague who, um, should be up here. Uh, he's uh, been my, my whiskey drinking buddy for uh, about 30 years uh, in different countries around the world. Uh, and presently is just coming back. He spends most of the year in Lebanon and Tripoli, Lebanon uh, for the Syrian conflict. But he also was an academic and a scholar and, and uh, not only went to the London School of Hygiene, but also Berkeley. And he's been one of the, the the, the, the few orthopedic surgeons that actually does the um, economic evaluations that are needed. So that's also you know, within our uh, domain and we hope to do as a, an advocate and as having really smart uh, researchers such as Dave, uh, Sam Morshed is another one of our PhD researchers in our group. And I think we're gonna be in a position to really measure things better and, and try to understand you know, surgical impact and burden. Uh, and hopefully along with some of our surgical colleagues here at UCSF to be able to you know, fight for the NIH grants that are diminishing, but um, they, you know, they're extremely uh, competitive and, and not very, not very uh, present uh, at, at the present time, but uh, there is, the good news, again, we're starting to sit at the table. Many of us uh, decided to you know, leave the operating room for a little bit of time and get some education. And I went to the London School of Hygiene and, and my sabbatical in 2003. And that really helped me cement my thoughts and, and hopefully uh, allows me to conceptualize a little better uh, to be in the, uh, sit at the table and advocate for the stuff that we, we need to advocate for. It's, it's very much part of health systems building. And, uh, you know, when you couch it in those terms, it totally makes sense. I think you were first, go ahead. Uh, outliers, you know, who has stepped up to the plate? There, there have been some, uh, WHO, uh, programming in terms of the decade for road traffic. So there are public health endeavors that have come down the pike uh, to get ministries of health and governments involved in tackling this problem. So it's not, uh, 
uh, it's not a mystery if you if you live in many of these countries, you know what the burden is. People live the burden, um, they experience the burden, and in terms of solutions, they're complex. They they really are, and and it requires the the governments to work through multiple ministries of health and transportation and defense and 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 the like that have to come together and work. And I, and I would say uh, places like perhaps China can actually start to make enormous impact. Um, it was interesting, I mean, and it wasn't that long ago that just the trauma system in, uh, in England improved dramatically approximately 10, 10 years ago and showed enormous improvement, and, and this is in a developed uh, world in developing countries, low and middle income, uh, you do need central and a combination of central authority, like the Chinese have. Um, a, a place like India, which has you know enormous brain power, but um, incredibly bureaucratic, and uh, you know they they can't seem to make a dent in the problem. And, and people are you know if anyone's traveled to to India, they they know you're scared um, to death of of being in the roads. So I, I'm having a hard time thinking of, of who has really done well as an outlier, um, but uh, certainly they're, the outliers tend to be the, on the negative side rather than the positive. Yeah, I might just add that I think it does, I mean, I don't, I don't know of really good specific uh, outliers uh, on the country level, but I think if you look at sort of the trend, it, it tends to really strongly, at least the road traffic injury burden, tends to correlate pretty strongly with uh, with the income of the country. So in other words, the middle income countries are doing better than the low income countries. And if you look back at the United States, I mean, we had huge road traffic problems as well in the 1970s, and then eventually um, changes were made and there's improvement. And I think as, as development does occur in a lot of these places, then there are gonna be improvements that go hand in hand with it on the sort of road safety and prevention side of it. Um, but um, I'm not sure there's a really great examples of ones that don't sort of fit their uh, sort of the economic bracket that they would fall into. Um, and I also don't think that that necessarily uh, is a reason why we, we need to be passive and just let these countries develop. I think there's a lot of patients every year that there's potential to benefit from improve by advocacy and proving the trauma care system is better than what the curve would say they should. Yeah, I think, um I mean, China is a developing country. I mean, it's a, it's still a uh, uh, largely a two-tiered system. Um, the you know the powerhouse cities in the east, and then the rest, the remainder of the nearly billion people that that don't live in those areas. We actually had the delegation of the um, the, the Chinese Trauma Association come to visit us at San Francisco General. Uh, I think that was about four or five years ago. Uh, so the president of the you know. China Orthopedic Trauma Association, and uh, they really were looking, you know, very, very closely at um, some of the things that we've done. And, and as I said, I think they are keen to make improvements. So I, I have, I would put my, you know, um, uh, pesos on um, China making dramatic improvements uh, than I would uh, say India. Um, but but I think you're right. They they have the again the author authoritarian type of government that can implement changes much more quickly. Uh, they just have large vast regions of of you know rural type areas that have you know, you know poor um, poor healthcare systems. Yeah. So there's a term in that's pretty popular in global health called task shifting. And the concept is taking a more complex task that's done by specialists here and teaching somebody who's a mid-level provider. You see that here with physician's assistants and nurse practitioners being able to prescribe uh, drugs and, and whatnot. So in orthopedics, there's an orthopedics officer program, which is um, does a lot of bones, like setting the fractures and casting splinting, um, stabilizing the trauma injuries. And those programs have been pretty successful. You Uganda is a really good example of a, of a very formal um, orthopedic officer 
Cancer Program. Also, there's one in Malawi that we're partnered with. And those have helped build up kind of the base of the pyramid of a, of a workforce. Um, the challenge now is keeping that knowledge up to date and also making sure that those orthopedic officers are in collaboration with the orthopedic surgeons and the greater teaching hospitals. So there's a continued um, education going um, going on as well as the outcomes of the of those patients so the the failure of the task shifting model is to have it end there and not have it go on to um, to be kind of an integrated model um, and so those are those are really great programs there's also a lot of nurse anesthetists that are used in developing countries to provide anest uh, anesthesia care and so those are those are an investment, of course, but um, you could, they've shown that you can ramp up a skill set um, within a year or two, um, which we would traditionally take, you know, Dave went to school for a very long time to do what he's doing now. So, so um, those are things that we definitely promote. We've, we've promoted them by studying them, studying the impact of them, and also advocating for those programs um, to better bridge with the teaching, the teaching programs. So in addition to that, I think um, part of the recognition uh, is not just um, being multidisciplinary, but we don't um, believe that we have solutions for the places that we partner with. Um, we really, as an organization, hope to empower them in ways, and, and that's why we keep emphasizing the fact that we're really academic to academic partnering, not telling them what to do or uh, like looking at the way we did it because you know we're we're so smart. Um, they know their context. Uh, they live it every day, and and they're all super bright. And uh, it's it's that's the thrill of of being an educator uh, in in a place where everyone's hungry. So that goes across uh, all disciplines, and the the solutions really are going to come from them, and they're going to help to make the um, changes and policy changes. So uh, we're sensitive to that. Uh, we've been able to do some studies uh, that speak to that a little bit. We did a study in, in Ghana uh, that was kind of fascinating, quick story. Uh, I was over there um, four years ago or so um, with another educator, uh, uh, Peter Trafton, who worked here a long time ago at San Francisco General and then went to Brown. Uh, we went over together and we were in um, Comfo Noche Teaching Hospital in the Kumasi, which is the second city of Ghana. And um, the, the, the story there is much of road traffic um, study uh, came out about 15 years ago out of that town because it's the second city, it sits in the center of Ghana, and all roads, slave roads, went through Kumasi, and then there was a single road that went to Accra uh, to bring slaves to North America. So, you know, it's a very impactful, in, in my mind, uh, place to work. And uh, the road traffic, like everybody, come, just comes together there. Uh, but. Uh, we chose to, with lots of partners, to kind of develop an orthopedic training program in Kumasi, and we worked with other organizations, and we were central in this this effort. But uh, as Peter and I went over there, we were looking at, at one of the the uh, wards. You know, they have the huge uh, wards. You know, the 50-year-old wards uh, hospital built uh, 50 years ago by the British. Um, but the Germans had just helped them build a new hospital, and they still had big, big wards. And we, we walked through uh, this ward of, and you couldn't walk through it. It was just bed to bed to bed of pediatric femur fractures. So kids, anywhere from one to 10, with femur fractures that had been treated and are treated in traction, in, in skin traction there because Ghana's equatorial. If you put them in casts or spica casts, uh, that's like a death sentence to, uh, to a child with a femur fracture. So they sit there for a month or six weeks or seven weeks, skin traction until the bones get sticky and then they finally can go home. And, and, and Peter and I looked at each other and said, well, this, there's, there's an opportunity here. And um, we do have the technology. There's something called the flexible nail 
uh, this titanium that you put within the bone and you can reduce a fracture and fix it and the kid can go home the next day. So that's the standard of care in, in North America. And fortunately, the, uh, uh, the surgeons who were in uh, Kumasi had all trained in Germany. They knew the technique. Um, they just didn't have the resources and they were in this hospital and couldn't advocate for the resources. Uh, but they knew how to do this surgery. And so, again, we didn't want to, we didn't have to tell them how to do it. What we had to do is actually help them study it so that they could advocate for the resources they need. And, you know, we were, we can do this. We can do a prospective study, which means you study it right from the beginning and you take each one. Um, but unfortunately, by the time we had gotten our IRB and permission and all these other things, the surgeons had already started to do the nailing. And because the kids were going home the next day, other parents in the, in the wards were saying, no, I, you know, we'll get some money together to have those flexible rods to have our kids go home uh, the next day. And what we were able to do, actually, it wasn't the, the, the perfect study design, but we were able to look at a cohort of those who were treated in traction versus those who were treated with the nail and do a cost-effectiveness study, and it was cost-effective to use the nails, even though the nails were cost, you know, had a cost to them. So with that information, um, not only did the local training uh, resident, uh, Ghanaian uh, orthopedic surgeon, uh, do the study and uh, and find the results, but he was also awarded the best international paper at our trauma society. Um, and the next spring, we went over to the West African College of Surgeons meeting, and now that study was presented to other surgeons in all of West Africa, and that's now becoming the standard of care in many centers. So I think that's an example of the power of academic to academic partnering. Not us going over and fixing the broken bone for them, but being interested, learning about what their problems are, helping them, empower them, giving them some, uh, some help with the statistics or the, the research proposals. And uh, in that regard, David's the, the smart one here. Um, it's, it does take a lot of work. It's not as easy as it sounds but it's impactful. And again, you know, we're incredibly proud of our partners who are doing the hard work to come up with the, the, the studies that they need, results that they need. They can take those to the ministries of health and say, hey, you know, where's, where's our nails? You know, take it to the local newspaper or have a politician, you know, uh, policy is policy and, and it's challenge, that's a whole nother level of challenge, but you need the data you know, real data. And I think we're helping to, to, to get that in, in, with our partnering institutions. Yeah, I'm glad you guys enjoyed the, um, the series. We, were, we weren't sure about um, if we keep you awake or not. Uh, talking about broken bones, it can only get you so far. But I think everybody recognizes that um, some, everybody's touched by orthopedics in some way or another throughout their, and some people are touched multiple times throughout their life. So it's important to connect those dots and understand a little bit more about the people be behind and um, behind the table and on the other side of the table what, what they're doing about it. So it's been really great talking with all of you.